Welcome back to another Rip Rockin' Rocket Rundown episode of Space This Week, the Monday, or for channel members Sunday, show in which we dive into all the latest and greatest news regarding SpaceX's Starship, all the launches and events we saw over the past seven days, all the launches we're expected to see over the coming seven days, and a rundown of all the most interesting spaceflight anniversaries that'll be happening this week. So let's get straight to our first segment all the latest news regarding the development of SpaceX's Starship. Starship prototype serial number 15 made its successful test flight on the 5th of May, where it gave us a spectacular show, becoming the first ever Starship prototype to conduct a full flight test to 10 kilometers and land successfully, without explosion on impact, or in the case of SN10, shortly afterward. Since then, it was moved to a site near the entrance of Starbase to serve as a monument to SpaceX's achievement. But that left a few questions regarding SN16, 17, 18, and 19, all of which were to serve as backups for the SN15 should it end up being unsuccessful. Now, SN17 to 19 were fairly early on in their construction, so were promptly scrapped, but SN16 was pretty much completely ready, so fans started to speculate if SpaceX would really decommission a brand new new vehicle or if they would find some other use for it. Well, this week has been a bit of a wild ride for SN16 news. At first, it looked as though it might have been retired as SpaceX rolled it out of the high bay and placed it on a display stand alongside SN15. However, Elon Musk appeared out of nowhere and stated on Twitter that SpaceX might use the SN16 on a hypersonic flight test. Hypersonic flight is much faster than supersonic, usually it's a speed of Mach 5 or above. To reach these levels of speed, SN16 would need to fly much higher than its predecessors, so if SpaceX were to follow through with this, then my guess would be that they'd ditch it in the ocean like they planned to with SN20 and booster number 2, rather than attempt to steer it back to base. And speaking of SN20, this hypersonic flight test would probably be in service to SN20's orbital test flight, which would involve speed in excess of Mach 25 during re-entry. So far, we don't know if SN16 will fly before SN20, given that any additional flight tests would put a significant pause on the construction of all the ground support equipment and buildings required for the orbital test flight. Also, at this point, Elon claiming that SpaceX might do something with a Starship vehicle is no guarantee at all, so I'd take it with a hefty grain of salt. Elsewhere on the construction site, BN2 is coming along very well, the liquid oxygen tank has been stacked, and the liquid methane tank is undergoing fabrication as well. There is still a long laundry list of tasks needed to get this mammoth booster finished, stacking of the methane tank, grid fin installation, power supply, and the spaghetti of wiring installation, more pipe work, and last but not least, the installation of the 29 Raptor engines. We did get an interesting development on the Raptors though. SpaceX President Gwyn Shotwell walked past this not so subtly placed graphic during a commencement address, and it appears to show a countdown to the Starship orbit launch of 25 days, 7 hours, and 30 minutes. It also shows which Raptor engines have been produced and shipped. Of course, this diagram is probably not very accurate anymore. We're definitely not 20 days away from an orbital flight, but it does confirm that all of Super Heavy's central engines are completed, so hopefully we should still get a flight relatively soon. My bet, based on the progress of everything, <laughs> is currently on August. Here's a 3D render of what the beginning of that very exciting livestream will look like. This amazing animation is a preview for an upcoming project by Alexander Svan. Check out the link in the description to the full resolution version of this. And of course, subscribe so that you can be notified when the full video is ready, because I have no doubt it'll be amazing. <laughs> Ahead of the orbital flight, SpaceX have been putting BN 2.1, the prototype super heavy tank, to good use this week. On the 17th of June, it underwent a cryo-proof test, which seemed to go well and hopefully means that no major reworks to the tank design are needed. The ground support tanks at the launch site are also rapidly going up and being moved into position. Thank you to Ocean Cam, by the way. They're new to the scene of SpaceX Starship photography and videography, so definitely check out their social media and YouTube pages in the description. The colossal launch pad tablet
power is also growing at a rapid rate. So far, it's five segments tall, with segment number six ready and waiting to be stacked, and segment seven quickly being assembled too. The tower will most likely be seven to eight segments tall when completed, and will serve as the final part of the Starship assembly, as it will hoist the Starship on top of the Super Heavy booster. It's unclear how SpaceX plan to integrate their bold plan to use the tower to catch the Super Heavy booster, but I suspect that this wasn't a consideration for the tower's design at this early stage in production, and that the catch system will be added either to new towers going forward, or retroactively added to the tower once prototype testing is much further down the road. Brendan's diagram saw both of the progress on the tower and of all the Starship vehicles and GSE tanks as a whole remain as regular and high quality as ever, and we all wait with bated breath for the Super Heavy launch and, of course, the potential hypersonic flight of SN16. Outside of Starbase, SpaceX recently closed on a deal to purchase Massey's Gun Shop and Range, which is just a stone's throw away from the Boca Chica manufacturing site. Sources close to the deal have indicated that this location will be called the Raptor Facility and will possibly be used as a location to repair, rebuild, and test Starship rocket engines. SpaceX making strides there to further find ways of streamlining and accelerating their ability to build, refurbish, and rapidly reuse the Starship vehicles. For now, I'm going to tie a nice bow on my coverage of Starship there and proceed to discussing all the other things that we saw happen last week. The first rocket launch we saw last week was on Tuesday the 15th of June. This was a Minotaur 1 launch vehicle launching very quickly from the Mid-Atlantic Regional Spaceport, carrying the Enrol 111 payload, a classified reconnaissance payload that because it's classified, we don't really know anything about, other than the fact that the Enrol 111 consists of three separate payloads. It's been a while since we had a Minotaur 1 launch, nearly eight years in fact, so this was definitely a fun one to see. And also, it's orange! which makes a nice change from the greys and whites that we usually see. <laughs> Next up, we saw China launch three astronauts, or to give them the name that the Chinese use, Taikonauts, to their newly established space station core module Tianhe, the first module of the Tiangong Chinese space station. Currently, it also has the Tianzhu-2 cargo spacecraft attached as well. The Shenzhou-12 spacecraft successfully docked with the station, and the crew has now begun their three-month mission on board, during which they will verify and test key components of the station, the environmental and life support systems, conduct extravehicular activities and operations, and conduct a multitude of scientific experiments from a range of disciplines. This flight marks the first of four crewed missions for the space station's construction, which is planned to be completed by 2022. Hopefully, those rockets' first stages will land in slightly better places places than this launches, one of the boosters ended up landing on a civilian road. At least it would have touched down fairly softly, since it came down via parachute. The same day as Shenzhou-12, we saw SpaceX launch a GPS Block 3 satellite to medium Earth orbit. The satellite, dubbed Neil Armstrong, is the first US Department of Defense payload to fly on a Falcon 9 with a previously flown first stage booster, as this particular Falcon 9 first stage previously flew another GPS Block 3 satellite to orbit back in November 2020. And it will almost certainly fly again, since it successfully landed 647 kilometers downrange on the Just Read the Instructions drone ship. And can I say, I think this has got to be the best Falcon 9 drone ship landing footage we've ever seen. What do you think? The payload fairings were recovered as well. They were fished from the water by SpaceX's new fairing recovery ship, Hose Briarwood. The fourth and final launch we saw last week took place on the 18th of June, this time back in China. This was a Long March 2C, which carried three Yaogen reconnaissance satellites to low Earth orbit, as well as a Tianqi-14 CubeSat for the Internet of Things. Anyway, quite a lot of launches overall this week. I think the Shenzhou-12 was my favourite to watch, simply because crewed flights are always very exciting to see. But then again, that landing footage of the Falcon 9 was definitely breathtaking. What are your thoughts? Leave them down below. And hey, while you're down there, make sure you've hit the like button if you're finding this video enjoyable. It really helps the channel out. Anyway, with last week covered, let's take a look at what's happening this week. The first orbital launch of the week will take place on Wednesday the 23rd of June. This will be the second operational launch of Virgin Orbit's Launcher 1, which is an air-launched rocket that's deployed from the wing of a modified Boeing 747. 
This flight, dubbed Tubular Bells Part 1, named after the song Tubular Bells, the first record produced by Virgin Records, will carry four CubeSats to low Earth orbit. Two of them are for technology demonstration, one from the Netherlands and one from America, and the other two satellites are two Polish Stork Earth observation satellites. Air launches are certainly fun to watch, given how different they are from what we normally see, so hopefully this mission succeeds and Virgin Orbit can capture some footage that's even better than the great shots we got of the last Launcher 1 mission. Next up, we have a Falcon 9, which will launch on Friday the 25th. This is SpaceX's Transporter 2 mission, and it will carry lots of small satellites to low Earth orbit in what will be SpaceX's second dedicated small sat rideshare mission. On board will be about 79 small sats from various customers across the globe. Among them is the QMR KWT, an education satellite which will be the first ever satellite from Kuwait. The final launch expected this week will also be on the 25th and will be a Soyuz 2.1B, launching a Signals Intelligence satellite to low Earth orbit on behalf of the Russian Aerospace Forces. It'll be launching from the Plasetska Cosmodrome. And that's this week's calendar of launches in a nutshell. Of course, rocket launches can often deviate from their planned times and dates, so keep checking the relevant news sources throughout the week in case anything changes. What I'm certain won't change though is history, because, you know, time. <laughs> Let's use this abysmal segue to move along to the video's final segment now, all the best and most interesting spaceflight anniversaries that'll be taking place this week. The first anniversary of the week takes place today in 2004 and was the day on which Spaceship One became the first privately funded space plane to reach outer space. The most striking aspect of the vehicle's design is its feathered wing system, in that during re-entry the rear half of the wing and tail booms fold 70 degrees upward in order to increase drag and maintain stability. Spaceship One was an experimental aircraft and is fairly comparable to the X-15, which, like the Spaceship One, was launched from the air by a carrier aircraft and was only suborbital. To reach orbit itself would require more than 60 times the energy of Spaceship One, but of course orbital flight was never the objective. Other records broken by Spaceship One include the first privately funded aircraft to exceed Mach 2 and Mach 3, and the first privately funded reusable crewed spacecraft as the vehicle was reflown to space twice more in September and October of 2004. After this, it was retired and is now on display at the US National Air and Space Museum in Washington DC. Since the success of Spaceship One, Virgin Galactic have joined forces with the builders of the aircraft, scale composites to work together on building a bigger and better version of the vehicle designed for space tourism. Spaceship 2, the current iteration dubbed VSS Unity, achieved spaceflight in December 2018 and most recently in May 2021. The most recent iteration of the space plane, Spaceship 3, was rolled out in March 2021 and is expected to undergo glide and ground testing over the summer. Here's hoping Virgin will fulfill their goal of building a whole fleet of these things so that access to space will be more affordable to the masses. Next up, we have twin Salyut anniversaries. On the 22nd of June in 1976, the Salyut 5 space station was launched, and on June the 24th in 1974, the Salyut 3 space station was launched. Both were launched by a Proton-K launch vehicle. They are interesting, actually, as these two space stations, as well as the failed Salyut 2, were different from all the other Salyut stations. These were actually highly secretive Almaz stations flying under the Salyut designation as a cover-up. Their true purpose was military. Salyut 3, or OPS-2 to give it its true name, hosted the crew of Soyuz 14 for 15 days in July 1974, and a second expedition was planned for the following month, but unfortunately the crew failed to reach the station. The space station was equipped with a cannon <laughs> based on the one from the Tupolev Tu-22 bomber, which was tested while the station was uninhabited. Now, some sources claim that it was fired to depletion, while others state that three firings took place. The results of the tests still remain classified, so we really don't know for sure. Wild stuff though, by the way. Salyut 5, or OPS-3 to give it its real name, was visited by two crews in mid-1976 and late 1977 before being deorbited in August of 1977. It was the third and final secret Almaz station after the Soviet military decided that the cost and logistics involved in running a manned space station didn't really outweigh the ease of using robotic satellites. Sticking to the theme of Russian space stations for the next anniversary now, on the 25th of June in 19 
1997, an unmanned Progress spacecraft collided with the Russian space station Mir. Progress spacecraft are unmanned resupply missions used on both Mir and today on the International Space Station. The 1997 collision happened when the vessel was undocked from Mir, moved away from the station, and then re-approached under manual control to test if Russia could reduce the cost of Progress missions by eliminating the automated docking system. The test didn't go particularly well. While under the control of Space Station Commander Vasily Sabliev, the spacecraft collided with the station's Spectre module, significantly damaging the module and a solar panel. Following the collision, the Progress spacecraft was maneuvered away and deorbited. Today, Russia still used the automated system for docking the Progress spacecraft, so hopefully no more collisions will happen in the future. Next up, another Soviet anniversary. On the 26th of June in 1971, an N1 rocket failed during a test flight. The N1 was, of course, the Soviet equivalent of the Saturn V, intended to send cosmonauts to the moon. Its first stage remains the most powerful rocket stage ever brought to operation, though the rocket itself was destroyed during each of its four test flights. The N1 launch failure for this week was the third flight of the rocket, the N1 serial number 6L. The launch went well initially, but shortly after liftoff, the rocket experienced an uncontrolled roll, beyond the capability of the control system to compensate. Now, this was recognised by the internal computer, and it sent a first stage shutdown command to the first stage, but unfortunately, the guidance programme had been set to prevent this from happening until 50 seconds into the launch. As such, the rocket continued to roll, eventually to nearly 40 degrees per second, which caused the fuselage to fail and the rocket disintegrated due to the structural load. At 50 seconds, the engines were then mercifully shut off, but this wasn't before the interstage truss between stage 2 and 3 had twisted itself apart. The upper stages separated from the rocket and rained down about 7 kilometers from the launch site, while the first two stages had enough momentum to travel a little bit further, eventually slamming into the ground about 15 kilometers from the launch site, creating a 15 meter deep crater on impact. Oof. <laughs> On the 27th of June, we have the anniversary of a successful launch. This was in 1995 and was the launch of Space Shuttle Atlantis on STS-71, which, on this mission, would become the first space shuttle to dock with the Mir space station. The shuttle Mir program was a collaborative 11-mission space program between the United States and Russia that involved the space shuttles visiting the Mir station. One of its chief purposes was to allow the United States to learn from the Russians' experience with long-duration space flight and to create a spirit of cooperation between the two previously competing nations and their space agencies. The final anniversary for the week is also on the 27th of June, when, in 2013, NASA launched the Interface Region Imaging Spectrograph, a space probe to observe the Sun, with particular emphasis on how solar material moves, gathers energy, and heats up as it travels through the little understood regions in the Sun's lower atmospheres. It was launched by a Pegasus XL rocket, and the spacecraft has shown us that the Interface Region of the Sun is significantly more complex than previously believed. The probe remains operational to this day. And that's a wrap on all the best historic spaceflight anniversaries this week. And that's it for another episode of Space This Week. Kind of weird how the history segment this week was so dominated by Soviet space stations, which I guess is sort of a nice tie to the launch of the Shenzhou 12 to the Chinese space station. Overall, I guess there were a lot of anniversaries this week, which I guess is fitting since there were so many space flights last week. Hopefully the slightly emptier schedule this week will give us some time to breathe. Anyway, if you hadn't noticed already, there is a scrolling list of names on screen. They are my patrons. If you'd like to join those names, then you can click the Patreon button on screen or via the link in the description. And hey, you can join my channel as well by clicking the join button below the video. Get some emojis to spam in the comments and get a cool badge next to your name. There are two videos on screen for my channel that I think you'll like. YouTube thinks you'll like them anyway. The algorithm put them there. It's not me, guys. Don't worry if they suck, but I mean, they're from me. So hopefully, hopefully they're good. Anyway.